Assalamu alaikum, hello and welcome to Africa This Week with me, Khalil Charles. The show looks at the affairs of sub-Saharan Africa and the African diaspora. On today's program, we'll be discussing the growing humanitarian situation that's caused by drought and famine in Ethiopia. We'll also look at the effects of the Chinese economic slowdown on African nations linked to the Beijing economy. But first, the South Sudan army, led by the president Silva Kerr, said on Monday that it has begun to withdraw its troops from the city's capital, Juba, ahead of the deadline agreed with the rebels for the former vice president, Reik Mashar. Our reporter, Adam Amuno, has more on this and the rest of this week's headline news. The peace accord signed on August the 26th requires the withdrawal of all military forces within a 15-mile radius of the city within 90 days, a period which ends later this week. But the late start of the army pullout means a full withdrawal won't be completed by the agreed date. South Sudanese opposition leader Riek Mashar announced he would travel to Uganda to meet President Yoweri Museveni to discuss the peace process, the 28 states controversy and his return to Juba. 32 people were killed on Monday when at least three suicide bombers blew themselves up at a market in northern Cameroon. Police said the assailants hit a local market in Bodo village near the frontier of Nigeria in one of the deadliest attacks in the far north region since 2013. An earlier report mentioned three suicide bombers, but a local source said there were four young girl bombers. Four opposition candidates for the Niger presidential election signed an agreement to support the candidate who will be in the best position in the case of a second round. The vote is due to take place on February the 21st. Enhancing trade and tackling regional insurgencies topped the agenda as Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta and his Nigerian counterpart Mohamedou Buhari held bilateral talks in Nairobi on Thursday. Following talks with Buhari, Kenyatta told reporters in a statement that a message of solidarity was being sent by the African continent to those who worked against peace and tolerance. The two leaders agreed on promoting trade ties between the two countries and said that intra-Africa trade and investment was key to African integration. Former Ivorian President Laurent Gbagbo on Thursday denied charges of clinging to power by all means as his long-awaited trial opened five years after post-Pol violence wrecked the West African nation. Gbagbo becomes the first ex-head of state to stand in the dock of the International Criminal Court in The Hague in a case which will test the tribunal's avowed aim to deliver justice to the victims of the world's worst crimes. Prosecutors accused Bagbo and his co-accused Charles Bligold of orchestrating a plan to ensure he stayed in power even before he was narrowly defeated by his bitter rival Alassane Ouattara. On Thursday, a London-based leading tropical diseases expert warned of the Zika virus spreading to North America and Africa with no sight of a vaccine ahead. The Zika virus, linked to severe birth defects in thousands of babies in Brazil, is spreading rapidly across Latin America. The mosquito-borne disease is spread by infected bites from the Aedes aegypti mosquito. The virus, believed to have first been discovered over 70 years ago in Africa, has spread quickly. On Thursday, the World Health Organization said it could affect as many as 4 million people in the Americas. Amnesty International purports that satellite images showing five possible mass graves on the outskirts of Burundi's capital are consistent with testimony by witnesses who accused security forces of killing dozens of people in December. Witnesses said graves were dug on the afternoon of the 11th of December and before and after images and video footage show distributed earth at five sites in the Burundi area on the edge of Bujumbura. A spokesman for Burundian President Pierre Nkurunziza was not immediately available for comment on the amnesty report. The UN World Food Programme said on Thursday that the drought relief effort in Ethiopia needs about $500 million to fund programmes beyond the end of April. The fund will be used to support 10.2 million people facing critical food shortages this year. 
Ethiopia is battling one of its worst droughts in decades that in parts of the country eclipses the 1984 crisis when rain failures and conflict caused famine, killing an estimated one million people. This time, the Horn of African Nation is at peace and has an economy that has grown rapidly for more than a decade, helping the government put in place agriculture, health and social programmes to build resilience against lean periods. But the scale of this drought, blamed on the El Nino weather phenomenon, is even overwhelming those measures. Joining us to discuss the last story about the situation in Ethiopia is Mahmoud Youssef, who's founder of the Runta News, an online news platform that focuses on East Africa. He's based in Seattle in the United States. Can I just uh, welcome you to the program? Uh, can I ask you first, uh, Mahmoud, can I ask you about the situation in Ethiopia and where are the main areas that are affected by the drought and indeed the growing famine? Thank you for uh, bringing this situation to the world attention. Uh, as far as I know, I see and, uh, the situation is worsening and uh, this drought right now is affecting a uh, wide area. In, the, in the Ethiopia so far, and uh, I just saw a video about uh, the eastern part of Ethiopia, which are inhabited by Somali, and uh, they are now losing their livelihood, uh, livestock, people are dying there, and the health is not even uh, uh, close, and that's what I see right now, and it's sad, uh, whatever it, uh, the cost might be, uh, this is right now is the repeat situation of 19. Uh, 84 uh, drought, for, which has killed, as you said, uh, 1 million uh, people in Ethiopia. We could like to make some comparisons if we can, because people do remember the, the droughts and the famine of the 1980s, which of course mobilized and galvanized the world to, to make uh, appeals for the people of Ethiopia. Um, what is the comparison that can be made between that time and the growing humanitarian crisis that we are now facing? Uh, even, uh, you know, to to hear is uh, hard right now. Ethiopia is experiencing this uh, kind of a drought. The world right now attention is going to different areas, uh, such as uh, Middle East and the ISIS. And the people even hardly know now what's going on. At that time, uh, 1984, the world has come together and uh, galvanized and uh, united their efforts. And as you know, you know, we are the world was the theme uh, held by the most famous artists at that time. And the attention was higher at that time. And this time is a very, very different situation. And uh, people have to know, has to know and organize themselves uh, and uh, help these people before it gets worse. So if I understand you rightly, the world attention, well, there isn't sufficient attention that has been given to this issue at the moment. Let's look at, at the moment also at the government, the government of Ethiopia. Ethiopia as a country isn't going, uh, isn't doing so bad. We understand the the GDP uh, of the, for the country is is, is growing. Um, the situation there economically uh, isn't as bad. Why is it that the government hasn't been able to cope with the situation of drought and growing famine in the country? That's a good question. Uh, the government of Ethiopia right now, they, as as they say, you know, progressing uh, as fast as possible. And the economy is growing so big uh, now. I, I think they call it the fastest growing economy in Africa. Uh, we, we see, you know, progress things like the dam uh, and, and uh, Renaissance Dam, which was built to hold water for the uh, such, such drought, people to escape from there to at least, you know, have uh, some other places to be uh, and, and settle it. And also we. Uh, see right now the light rail or the train in Addis Ababa. So the economy is doing good, but the attention is paid to this uh, place. Very places is so far very, very low, and uh, that's, I don't know why. So that should be asked, you know, the Ethiopian government, Mahmoud, uh, why, they're not, why they're not doing good. Right. Mahmoud, I don't want to put words into your mouth. However, um, would you say that there has been some mismanagement with regard to the, the drought and the needs of the people? It could be. It could be, and that, you know, it should be also held, held uh, and accountable, you know, whoever loses life there, if the government can do something and they don't do enough. 
And that, I think, you know, it, it, it's up to them. But the world has to hold accountable to the Ethiopian government. Indeed. But there's also a question of what kind of humanitarian aid can come through. And has this been coming through uh, successfully? Are people getting what they need? Because we did hear in that, in that report that there seems to be a, a period of very slow, if you like, uh, injection of, of important aid. Well, you know, the effort has to come from everywhere, uh, such as local, local government in that region and Ethiopia, the federal government. Also, you know, the people uh, themselves, you know, has to also organize themselves. The people like in the diaspora, for example, Somalis, you know, who live there, they have people in the diaspora and uh, they have to come together and organize themselves and situation before it gets worse. They should do something right now and now. Indeed. Now, many people have pointed out that the drought has been particularly um, as a consequence, if you like, of the weather system El Nino over there, which has infected not just Ethiopia, but also the whole of the East African region. Is that what we're seeing? Are we seeing other countries also affected by the situation? I think in this particular you know, area, it's, uh, and, uh, they are unlucky right now. I, I hear from the news, uh, Cairo is getting a rain, which is unusual. Uh, and then Jordan have snow on the ground, which is also unusual. So the East African always had had this problem coming back again and again. And there has to be some kind of a, a program that will prevent such, you know, disaster. And uh, projects like that, you know, East Africa has also other problems like wars, uh, conflicts. And, uh, that's, uh... Yes, yes, of course. Let's just touch on that. Of course, in South Sudan, there's also a similar um, humanitarian crisis, but that crisis is not so much caused by, by, by weather, but, but caused in co indeed by, by the conflict that is going on there. Um, what, where are the other places uh, that, that this has been, uh, been affected that you perhaps can give us some examples of? Uh, as you say, that South Sudan is also another sad thing to see. You know, uh, I'm a Somalian origin uh, in the U.S., and uh, what I see in there is just like uh, what happened in Somalia, the clan conflict, you know, and the wars, and they are just newly born countries. So the other areas, it might be, you know, uh, in Congo, uh, an example, you know, what's happening there, uh, maybe, you know, in Nigeria, uh, war conflicts are happening also. Uh, it's it's uh, spreading, and uh, that's another situation. People have to, you know, uh, put uh, extra effort in order to prevent uh, further deaths and disasters. You mentioned that you're from Somalia, and the situation in Somalia is also of concern. What has been the situation there with regard to the weather systems and what's happening in that region? Lately, Somalia has been also getting some, some, some rain, some regions, but, uh, you know, the government in Somalia, as you know, is a weak, you know, and uh, also it, it cannot help that much its people, and it's also protected by other foreign governments. So uh, I don't see any hope, you know, so far there. Uh, the, the conflict is going on still, Al-Shabaab, uh, you know, and Kenya and uh, Ethiopia also involved in Somalia. So the whole region right now in mess, and uh, it's sad that people are dying at everywhere, in everywhere. So what would be your message then? Because you did mention that the question of support seems to be out of the media and seems to be out of the, the, the limelight. What would be your message to the donors and the people who, who needed to, need to, to, to step up, if you like? You know, my message is uh, the people around the world and the government is, and, uh, and uh, the community in the international to act quickly and act now. And uh, the government has to also uh, find out a solution is not to continue war. War was enough in Africa, particularly in East Africa. But there has to be some other kind of, uh, you know, uh, deals to deal with each other, to come together on the table and talk. This will never end. And people will die always. And the drought is also another problem that kills the people. So my message is uh, find out a solution and come together and find and get peace with each other.
Mahmoud, I hope that we will be hearing that message loud and clear and people will come to the aid of those in Ethiopia and indeed in the East African region. Thanks very much indeed for joining the programme. Now we're going to be taking a short break and when we come back we'll be turning our attention to China and looking at the effects of the economic downturn on African economies. See you after this.